in memory of Dick Robinson and sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Good afternoon, I'm Monica Valentine, Program Specialist of the Library of Congress, and I'm here today with Derek Barnes. Good afternoon, Derek, and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. Hey, hey, good afternoon, how you doing? I'm doing great, looking forward to our conversation today. For our audience, welcome. You can check out our, um, our video on demand sessions, uh, particularly the one with Derek Barnes at loc.gov slash bookfest. Um, this time is primarily for you and your questions. We have up to 30 minutes. I have a few questions for Derek to start us off, but it's really your time. Uh, we'll go as long as we can to answer all of your questions. All right, so Derek, if you're ready, we can begin. Okay. Ready. So in the video you recorded earlier for the festival, you mentioned a retail ad that you thought sent the wrong message about black boys. You said that it inspired I am every good thing. And all of your books seem to have a really positive message about black boys. Can you tell us why that's important to you? Well, uh, yeah, that ad was a clothing ad and it was an international ad. I don't even think it ran in the States, but it was from the company H&M. And they have boys of different, of different nationalities. And the little African boy, I think he was maybe around 10, maybe 10 years of age. And his shirt said, the coolest monkey in the jungle. And I always try to explain to children when I do school visits, if, you know, when you study the history of this country in regards to, you know, marketing, literature, you know, it was very, you know, we have a very dark history in regards to, you know, the racial, you know, epithets and stereotypes. And one of the very, you know, derogatory names that Black people were call were apes, monkeys, you know, simians. So in this modern day age, you know, and, and just and for that huge corporation to not have anybody in the room to squelch that idea was just crazy. You know, and I thought about my sons. I have four beautiful Black boys. Uh, Ezra is 20. Uh, Solo is 17, Silas, who's the cover boy for Crown, is 15, and Namdi is uh, 10. Four totally different personalities. Um, I've put so, you know, my wife and I put so much love and energy into these boys to go out into the world to be, you know, not only productive citizens, but it's a term we use in the house, you know, to be a difference maker. And it's one of the terms I use in the book. So, you know, if, if someone is not, you know, doesn't have the luxury or is not blessed enough to have a black boy in their immediate environment, they are probably more apt to go off of these stereotypes, you know, and that's one thing that we have to squelch. And I feel like my job is not only a, a, a black male author, but a father, black husband, a black son, a black, a, a black brother. Uh, as a artist, I have an obligation if I'm making books for black children, and it shouldn't have to be this way, but um, it is what it is. You know what I mean? I, I, I have an obligation to make sure that every time I write a book or I create a character or I tell a story, that I'm putting black children, black and brown children in the most positive light that I possibly can to counter, counter these negative images that we still have in um American pop culture and even, you know, international pop culture. Right, right. So um, you just mentioned your sons, and that leads mm -hmm. me to a question. Do the Mighty Barnes brothers ever review your drafts when you write? And what role do they play in your writing process, if any? Most definitely. You know, as they've gotten older, um, I'm writing more middle grade novels and graphic novels. Uh, the books I'm probably most famous for are, you know, picture books, which are really just uh, poems that, you know, have been condensed and uh, of course added this beautiful illustrations from Vanessa Brantley Newton and Gordon James, who did I Am Every Good Thing and he illustrated Crown, shout out to Gordon. Um, so when they were younger, it was a little bit easier for me to get a thumbs up from them. But, uh, I've, you know, as long as they've been alive, that's the only thing they know me as, as a uh, author, as a writer, poet. So now that I'm writing for older children, they give me a thumbs up 
in regards to the language, in regards to the dialogue, which is so important. You know, not not in regards to uh, slang or keeping up with the you know current dialogue that kids are using, but it's very important that the dialogue between characters are you know really, really believable and real, and it really helps to have a 15 and a 17 year old in the house that I can um, bounce my um, characters off of, bounce my dialogue off of. And my wife kind of helps me now with the uh, poetry. You know, she reads everything that um, I may finish, partly because I just love hearing her voice and I love hearing her read my work, you know. So this is this is like a corporation we got here, you know. This is a, a family business in a sense. And I'm so yeah, grateful. Yeah, I love to hear that. Though. I love to hear the whole families involved. Um, so you yeah. talked a little bit about dialogue. Um, Maria M has a question about illustrations. She says the illustrations in your book are gorgeous. What is your process working with your illustrator? Do you have much input in creating them? You know, when you first start out, you don't have a lot of input. The publishing company actually picks who the illustrators are. But once you've had a little bit of success, um, you get a say so and who you may want to work with. And, um, you know, the whole the whole process is you don't really interact with the illustrator. Uh, they give the illustrator the manuscript and um, the illustrator does their own interpretation of the uh, text and of the story. But now that I have a little bit of clout, I don't really work like that. I'm I'm a very personable person. So as soon as as soon as I've as soon as we've landed a, a, a deal for a picture book, I already have in my mind who I want to work with, what I want the images to look like. And as soon as we're able to land that illustrator, I want to give them a phone call and I want to have a conversation with them about what I see. Now they may use everything that I give them, or they may not use anything that I tell them, you know, at all. But um, I'm not just an author. I, I, I see myself, I mean, you know, I, I, I like to see myself work through the whole creative process. Like I have an idea about how I want the characters to look, um, certain uh, scenes in the book I wish to be illustrated. And I'm not a uh, bossy kind of author, but I, I think I think it's important. And I also think it's helpful to get that information to the illustrator early on. And then I just leave them alone and let them do that thing. Now there's some illustrators who want that input and there are some illustrators who don't want to hear from the author at all. They just want to do their own thing. But again, I don't really work like that. You may not want to hear from me, but you're going to hear from me. And I, I think it, it can't do anything but help the illustrator. Just as long as I'm not impeding on their, you know, creative process, which I never want to do. Right, right. So I see you like to be involved with the whole concept from the beginning to the yeah, end. To the yes. end. All right. So interesting. Um, we have a question from Maria M. She says that her six-year-old daughter actually has the question for you. Who is your hero? Oh, man, my heroes are my sons. Um, you know, it's something. You, you see these little people enter into the world and you have to do everything for them, fend for them, feed them, clothe and bathe them. And then one day they become their own person and they start accomplishing things and achieving things that either you could have never seen yourself you know, accomplish and they go places and, and and places that you've never gone before and they've achieved things that you've never achieved before. And uh, man, I, you know, I want to impress them as much as I'm sure they want to impress, you know, my wife and I. Um, their opinions mean a lot to me. So does my wife. Um, I want them to be proud of me. I want my sons to be just as proud of me as I am of them. I want my wife to be proud to be married to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, I guess it's my family, but more so my sons, you know, to see these guys launch, to see my 20 year old go out into the world and, you know, um, you know become a, a mechanical engineer. And my, my second eldest boy, he's one of the best football players in this, in this entire state. 
and he, he has business, you know, aspirations and my you know, the cover boy of Crown, Nestle Snipes. We call him Nestle Snipes. His, his name is Silas, but he wants to become uh, a uh, respiratory surgeon and Namdi. You know, he's doing great things now, excellent student, and I'm just glad he's back in school. And, you know, these guys motivate me to be a better father and a better person. And they always lift me up just by just being who they are. And I'm, I'm, I always get, you know, kind of emotional when I talk about my sons. I'm just, I'm just extremely proud of them. Oh, no, no, it's fine for you to get emotional. That's a lovely answer. Um, you have mentioned that Langston Hughes is one of your literary heroes. And yes. uh, I'm wondering if you'd want to talk a little bit about him as a hero to you. And then also, are there other writers or non-writers that have been influential in your work? Yeah, Langston, I always, I always call him one of my homeboys because he's from Missouri. Um, you know, we're both from Missouri. I'm from Kansas City. And he was the first poet that I think I fell in love with his work. Um, I fell in love mostly, first of all, I think in the fifth grade, my, my teacher Ms. Shelby introduced me to his work because I was really falling in love with hip hop music at the time. That was in the mid eighties. So I was listening to LL Cool J, Run DMC, EPMD, Eric B and Rakim. And those guys were poets to me. Again, I come from a very musical household. My mother had a huge, you know, album collection. So some of the first writers I fell in love with were songwriters. Um, Stevie Wonder lyrics. I used to copy down his uh, lyrics when I, I got him out the album, and and all the lyrics were on the liner notes. And she saw how much I I, I, I was very much so interested in poetry, which is all hip hop is and song lyrics is, you know, especially from Stevie. So she introduced me to County Cullen and Langston Hughes, and I, I just gravitated more towards his work because it, because of the dialogue. Again, going back to dialogue, I fell in love with uh, a character of his named Jesse B. Simple, and uh, this was about a guy in the 1940s in uh, Harlem, 1950s in Harlem, who was always down in his luck. He couldn't keep he couldn't keep a woman. He couldn't uh, pay his rent, and he was always trying to hustle just to make ends meet. And it was just a dialogue that this character had with the um, beautiful people that lived in Harlem, you know. And I was maybe 10, 11 years old. And I uh, just started collecting as, as, as much of his work that I possibly could. But um, you asked about other heroes. Again, I'm, I'm a big music fan. I'm a big, uh, I'm a big jazz fan. Uh, being from Kansas City, you know, Charlie Parker is a huge hero. There's a big bust of Charlie Parker on 18th and Vine in Kansas City for everybody, anybody who's never been there. 18th and Vine is where all the hep cats used to be, like back in the 50s and 60s. You know, Miles Davis, um, you know, Cap Calloway, they used to come to 18th and Vine and play at all the, all the jazz places. So now they have a jazz museum and a Negro League baseball museum. It does a huge, like I want to say like a 12, 13 foot bust of Charlie Parker. And every time I go home, I sit at a bench in front of that bus and I talk, I talk to the bus. I may look crazy. It's mostly nighttime when I sit out and talk to Charlie Parker, but I just want to let him know that I appreciate him and I appreciate all the ancestors, all the creative ancestors, including Langston Hughes, including um uh, um uh, who's some of my favorite writers. Um Derek Walcott, he's from St. Lucia, one of my favorite poets of all time. Um, he's not one of my favorite writers. Uh, Wendelin Brooks, they're all pretty much poets, you know. <clears throat> so when I sit and talk to that bus, I tell him, thank you. And I am trying to hold it down and I'm trying to, you know, take that baton and, and, and take everything that they set up for her, I mean, for her us and take it to the next level. And I, I, I want Charlie and, and, and all the great jazz musicians, I'm a big John Coltrane fan, and I feel like I am doing their work, that I am um, you know, continuing their great you know, legacy that they set for not only me, but for other black artists, you know, musicians, other writers, poets, and playwrights, actors. Um, again, we have a huge responsibility when we standing on some large shoulders and I appreciate that and I recognize that. So 
Yeah, those are some of my Thank heroes. You. Okay. I'm sorry for the long for sharing answer. That. So <laughs> Teresa um, first notes that she likes your t-shirt. She says it's cool. <laughs> but then also she wants to know Thank how you. you became interested in being a children's writer. You know, I kind of fell into it. Um, I am a 1999 graduate of Jackson State University, the greatest historically black college in the land. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in marketing, met my beautiful wife there, met when we were just like 20, 21. And my first paid writing gig, I wrote for the Blue and White Flash. I wrote, I wrote for the newspaper. I wrote a advice column called Brown Sugar. And uh, everybody called me Hershey Brown on, on uh, campus. So that was my first writing gig. And because of that column, which um, we won uh, the best HBCU newspaper in my senior year, uh, I landed a job at Hallmark Cards. I was the first Black man in the history of Hallmark Cards, the greeting card giant, to be hired as a, a copywriter, a creative copywriter. And that was a great job. And I mean, I felt like I was in graduate school. There's so many talented painters, so many talented writers there. I learned a lot about uh, finding my voice. Uh, I learned a lot about the editorial process. And that's where the real magic happens. Like I'm, I'm finishing up a novel right now and I can't wait to get to the whole editorial um, part because that's, that's where things are moved around and things are made more beautiful. And while I was there, I met Gordon James. We've been friends for over 20 years. He was an illustrator there. He's the illustrator, of, again, of Crown and I'm Every Good Thing, two beautiful books. Um, and he introduced me to his literary agent, Miss Regina Brooks. Love that lady. Uh, been with her since 2003. She's been my literary agent for a long time now. And the first project she brought to me was for two early reader books uh, entitled Stop, Drop, and Chill and The Lowdown, Bad Day Blues. Those were my first two books uh, that came out. And um, they were early reader books. And uh, every other project that she brought to me after those two books were all children's books. Um, you know, before I signed a deal with her, I, I saw myself as being this great short story uh, writer, somebody that, that writes these beautiful, these beautiful, you know, novellas. But it seemed like every time we had a child, I landed a new book deal for children's books every single time. So I was like, you know, I might as well stick with this. There's a lot of opportunity in, in uh, children's books. And, 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 and now, you know, I realize it's so important that I stay in, in this genre because, uh, you know, you know, for many children, it's their first introduction to, you know, literature. And, you know, we're responsible for creating the next, you know, generation of book lovers, the next next generation of avid readers. And again, I take that responsibility very serious. So um, I love it. Even though my children are getting older, um, I, I don't really see myself doing anything else. I might want to do some... Uh, you know, audio or some biographical pieces on my favorite jazz musicians one day. But um, until then, I think it, um, until I finish, you know, until I can't write anymore, I'm always going to write children's books and just, again, highlight the beauty and the brilliance of Black children. That's good to hear. We're looking <laughs> forward to what comes next. Um, Black we have a question children. from Stacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have a question from Stacy who wants to know who helped you as a young writer to improve your writing. Do you have any advice for kids who might feel nervous about sharing their writing with other people? Yeah, I have uh, I have so many people that I can I can uh, thank. You know, my mother um, my mother has a high school high school education, but she was my biggest fan. She always took me to libraries, always took me to bookstores. She always made sure I had something to read. And she she recognized that I enjoy writing. I started writing when I was 10. So she has always been an advocate of my work. And um, I know she she may not be watching, but if she is, I love you, Mom. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Shelby, I think I talked about her. She was my fifth grade teacher. She she made sure that we 
you know, that we have material. And it was once upon a time, I mean, you know, things have come a long way in this industry. There was a, a time where there weren't any books that feature black children. Uh, if they if they weren't, you know, athletes, you know, runaway slaves uh, in the civil rights movement, but just children being children. But she gave us as many classic books as she possibly could. Um, some of them were adult poetry books, but she made sure that, you know, we have material. And, and I think I think that sparked my love for, you know, the written word. Well, my favorite teacher of all time, at, at this um, Mrs. Mary Rogers, she was my um, freshman high school teacher. And she was my, she was my English teacher. And she was also my creative writing teacher when I was a senior. And I was 14 at the time. And um, I was not ashamed to tell people that I was, that I wrote poetry because I also wrote hip hop. I was trying to be a hip hop artist at the time. But I, that was something that I did well. So I felt very confident that I did something that I, I knew my peers couldn't do. But Miss Rogers, it, it didn't matter what I wrote or what I turned in, it was all Pulitzer worthy. And she thought everything I wrote was amazing. And obviously I'm pretty sure it was not. But to get that love from her, to get that, get that encouragement, it's just really spurred me on to really grow and to be a better writer. And I, I'm Facebook friends with her now, and I, I thank her every single chance that I get. Um, I think it's so important for educators, parents, adults, period, to you know really support young people who have an interest, and in not just writing, but just in just in anything you know productive, anything positive, anything creative. Yeah, you know, that little bit of encouragement, um, you know, can go a long way. Can really um, launch. An amazing career, you know. Um, it, it's been a long road for me, but you know, it wasn't a day that I didn't think about, you know, Mary Rogers. Or I didn't think about my mom and the sacrifices, you know, that she made, and you know, Mrs. Shelby, or, 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 or all the people who've always encouraged me. So um, yeah, if if I uh, just shout out to all the educators that may be watching right now, I love y'all. I know this past. 19 months has not been easy on y'all and you, you you're you doing a great job whether it be virtually or you be in person and you just keep educating the babies and keep encouraging them because you just never know who these kids may turn out to be you know i'm sure miss rogers knew that i would grow up to be a um, award-winning children's book author i couldn't see it at the time but she did and maybe she didn't but just her being positive uh, is one of the reasons i'm here today so Love you, Ms. I love your answer because it is amazing what one inch, one or two interested in ad adults can do for a kid's life. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. So let's um, come back to today and let's talk about talk to your young audience who might be curious about what your writing process is like. Can you tell us what a day in the life of Derek Barnes as a writer is like? I am not a very organized person. <laughs> you know, you know, in my mind, I think about how I, how I want my day to play out. So I might even write it down. But it almost never goes that way. I try to drop Namdi off, uh, my 10-year-old, um, off at school. And I, I say I'm going to come back and work out for about an hour. But if I'm working on something, it's really hard for me to kind of focus on working out when I'm thinking about the next chapter or the next scene in a book. So after I drop Nambi off, I usually go and get my favorite drink if I don't have it, which is I, I try to drink as much water as I can, but I also drink Diet Mountain Dew. And that's my caffeine of a choice. I come back in my office, in my, in my beautiful office. I'm so grateful for this space, you know, that I have to write in. And I write from maybe nine to one o'clock and then I'll stop and I get some lunch. And I work again until it's time to go get him. And he's going to start riding the bus on, so I don't have to stop and start. But I try to write maybe 8 to 12 hours a day if I'm actually working on something. And um, just having my own space for writing on. Sometimes, like especially during last year when everyone was at home and they were learning virtually, it was kind of tough. Not that they were loud. Having four um Five, five other people in the house is, you know, very distracting. And so sometimes I, I will go to a hotel that's 
around the corner and I stay there for three days and I would actually work on something, especially if I, I just needed to clear my head and I had deadlines to turn in, I would go somewhere for like three days. There's a pond not too far from here. Sometimes I type in my van, um, type in the car, uh, sit in the back seat and work on something. I, I sit on benches outside, but this is my favorite space, you know, in my office. And I try to try to type eight to 12 hours a day. Wow. Okay. Well, we have another question from Teresa who asks, what role have libraries played in your life? Man, um, they play different roles in different stages of my life. You know, my mother used to take me to the library. She used to pull me in this radio flyer, this, this red wagon. I was like four or five years old and take me to the library on Saturday mornings. That's one of the only days that she was off during the week. My mother worked like two jobs sometimes. Uh, she was a uh, LPN, so she worked at nursing homes. But on uh, Saturday, she would take me, take me to the library. And we fill up that library and we would fill up that wagon and, and 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 bring those books home and I would sit in my closet with a flashlight tied to a shoestring and sit in there with pillows, you know, and um read to be able to be around so much, you know, to to be in you know, close proximity to be able to run your hand across all these different binds, all these different characters and stories and and, and these books took me to a different place. You know, we grew up, I grew up poor. Um, grew up, again, again, a single parent household, me and my brother, Anthony. So books helped me to just escape my neighborhood, which was a beautiful neighborhood. But I grew up in a very small house, very t a small two bedroom house. Um, there wasn't a lot of violence, you know, in my neighborhood, but it wasn't shocking when it did happen. You know what I mean? So not really having a lot of money to travel, you know, go, you know, summer vacations, rode a lot of Greyhound buses down to Mississippi and Tennessee to see my family members. So books was a way for me to to uh, travel across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, to go back into, you know, time machines. So to be able to sit in the library and, and, and live these different lives with, you know, an amazing influence on me. And when I became an adult, I think after like my sixth book, after um, Ruby and the Booker Boys came out, uh, I worked at the Kansas City Public Library in the outreach department. Um, I really thought my career was over. Um, I, I couldn't land a book deal to save my life. I think it's around 2011. This was after uh, we could be brothers came out and I, I did I've had so many odd jobs y'all y'all can't y'all can't imagine if you name it and it's legal I probably did it you know I'm talking about during the course of me trying to become a successful children's book author man and uh one of my favorite jobs working for the Kansas City Public Library I did outreach and I read all across the city of Kansas City we went to you know juvenile detention centers and I did creative writing exercises for them I met some very brilliant young men, you know, um, inside those walls. I went to daycare centers. We went to um, kindergarten classes, went to high schools. And I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about, about humility. I learned a lot about my audience, my future audience, people that were really going to buy my books. And it really helped me to kind of key in on my primary audience uh, going around doing these uh, we just did story time. I did readings, you know, and uh, I'm 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 so grateful for that period. You know, most of the time when you go through these phases and go through these periods in your life, uh, it doesn't feel good. But afterwards, you look at it and you look at it and and realize how grateful you are or you were to go through that period. So I'm so grateful for all the little jobs that I had. They really helped me to become the person I am today. And work for the Kansas City Public Library was. I saw the library from a different angle from when I did when I was a child, but it was one of the most pivotal moments in my, you know, maturation as a man and as a uh, children's book author. Wow, that's cool that you have that kind of history and connection to libraries and that you can see how it's influenced your writing today. 
Well, unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for. Um, you have been listening to author Derek Barnes talk about his book, I Am Every Good Thing. Thank you again, Derek, for joining us uh, at the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. It's been a pleasure. And once again, thanks to our audience. Please continue to enjoy the Thank festival. You. Take care, y'all.